Ghost and presence that we're feeling in this room right now. Oh, we give you thanks, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. I, I once had the, the pleasure of getting to go to a small church in a, the, a very tiny city called Atmore, Alabama. And, and I, I walked into the church, and, and it was a little bit strange because all the, all the, the saints were a little disheveled. Right? The, the men had their, their ties a little bit down. They had the top buttons unbuttoned. The, the women, their, their shirts were a little pulled, a little stretched. A little bit. There were bobby pins on the floor, and the service hadn't even started yet. Now, this this was a little strange, but I've seen it before. So I, I walked in, and I said, well, uh, was there service beforehand? Did I miss the prayer meeting? Is, is that what happened? They said, no. No, you didn't miss anything. We haven't started yet. In fact, you're one of the earliest people getting here. I said, okay. What's going on? What's happening? And they said, when we come into this sanctuary, we come with an expectancy that God is going to do the miraculous. We we come in with the expectancy that something is going to happen. So why waste the time? Why have to get comfortable? Why not kick off your shoes before you get in? Why not wave your hands as you walk into the sanctuary? I, I feel that spirit in this building that we are expecting God to do something. And right now, I feel that his presence and his power is in this room. I'm here to tell somebody this morning that anything is possible. That right now the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is here to answer your every call. Is here to fill every broken heart. Hallelujah. If you have something that you need to bring to the Lord, don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't be expected. God is here right now. He can touch you right now. He can heal you right now. He can fill you right now. Amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, mighty God, mighty God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, in this sweet presence, I feel in this sanctuary. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. We want to remember Alex and Ashley Freeman, uh, make sure they have a special healing for them. And we also want to remember our pastoral family, Pastor Jason and Sister Lacey. They are at home not feeling well. Be sure to remember them in your prayers. Um, We have many needs on our list. If you want to raise your hands, pick a name off that list. I believe in the power of healing. I know this church believes in the power of healing, and we can see the miraculous. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you expectant, Lord Jesus. Humble, Lord God, but waiting on a mighty touch and a mighty move, Lord. We know that your hand is on every situation, that your power is in it, moving and shaking right now, Lord God. We pray that every single need, Lord, be met here, Lord God. I pray that your power move in mighty ways, Lord God, that even though we can't see your Holy Ghost working, that we can't see your hand molding and shaping, Lord God, that we trust in you to move, to shake, to create, to mold, and to protect your people. Provide for those who need a provision right now. Send a healing spirit upon those who need your Holy Ghost touch right now, Lord God. And we thank you for all that you're going to do. Your Holy Ghost outpouring and the mighty miracles that we are going to begin to witness. In Jesus' name and in Jesus' name, let's lift a hand clap of victory up to the Lord. Amen. may be seated. Now we will move into our, another form of worship, and that is the form of giving. If you would like to text to give, text the word give to 833-406-0716. And now if you would join me in our prayer to open the heavens. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says that you will supply all my needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Your word says that whatsoever things I desire when I pray to believe that I receive them. 
I believe that my needs are supplied according to your riches and glory, for the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Lord be with you. We have some exciting announcements. Worship with us as we end.
Oh, come on. Let's just worship the Lord this morning. That's the presence of Almighty God that you feel in this building right now, what you feel on the live stream. Come on, why don't we just entertain His presence? Oh, change fall. You just stepped into the glory. When you step into the glory, anything's possible. Cancers are healed. Blind eyes are open. Deaf ears are unstopped. Hey, when you step into the glory of God, chains fall, fear's gone, something begins to happen. Come on, let's just worship Him a little bit. Let's just worship Him a little bit. The Holy Ghost is moving. Praise the name of the Lord. We serve a mighty big God today. Okay, for the three of you that believe it, let me tell the other folks. We serve a mighty big God today. I know we hear it all the time. We're used to it, church. We, we do this, right? This is our culture. This is what we do. But may we never forget that we serve a God who still speaks worlds into existence. Who still got the power to change your situation. Who still knows how to heal COVID-19. Well, glory, I just feel the Holy Ghost this morning. I feel like God's about to do something and wreck us up. Mess us up today. God wants to change some things in this building this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. For some of you who are looking at me like a calf, looking at a new gate, I'm not Jason Meyer. I love brother and sister Meyer very, very much, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to preach this morning. hate that he's not here, but I totally understand. I know he's watching today. I'm, I wish I was as cool as Jason Meyer was. But I'm not, so here I am. Praise God. I do want to say it's an honor to be in the house of the Lord, give honor to Pastor and Sister Meyer, and I give honor to Elder Sister Meyer. I don't say that uh, disrespectfully, but it's good to see Sister Meyer here today. Amen. We love the Meyer family. It's good to be, it's good to be home today. Now, I know some of you, again, you're looking really concerned. What does he mean by being home? Because seven years ago, or actually about six and a half years ago, if we're going to be a little bit more exact, this church gave me the greatest gift guy could ever get and that's a godly apostolic wife and so I count this home today good to be with family today and last week Abundant Life Sanctuary lost another godly apostolic young lady I guess if you raise them right that's what happens praise God and uh, we were at the wedding Brother Wyatt and Sister Rachel's wedding last week and Pastor Meyer asked me, said, I might need you to preach Sunday. We're going to possibly be out of pocket. and I've got somebody else taking care of service, but they've, they're sick. And so I, I, I need you on standby. Would you be available? And I, I said, yes, I would. He texted me Tuesday and said, I, I need you to preach. Brother Dan's still sick. and Can you handle it? And I just picked up the phone and called him. I said, Pastor, I need to tell you, I've never had this happen before. Pastored seven years. I've, I've preached out several years. I've been licensed a long time. I'm young, but I've been I've been around a long time. I've never had this happen before. But back in September, God gave me a word for this church. I told Brother Jay, I said, "Hey, I, I've got a word, and I, I really feel if you're not going to be there, you need to hear it before I preach it, because I don't want to be out of order of pastoral covering." I began to explain to him what I felt in the Holy Ghost. I told him that on the way home from Bishop's funeral, Sister Meyer, God gave me a word for this church. And I told Laura that I, I don't even know how to approach it. I, don't, I mean, I'm not an evangelist, first of all. I, I, I've got responsibilities. I'm a pastor. And, and 
I, I'm sure not one of those guys that calls and said, hey, bro, let me preach. I said, Lord, your will be done. I told my wife, we're just going to let God have it. And if God wants us to hear it, if this is, if this is me, it won't happen. But if it's God, God's going to put it all together. So here I am today. Understand this morning that I preach from a love for this church. I've already said, you've given me the greatest gift a man could ever have. This church, you don't realize it, but you have impacted not just Laura Knowles, but there's three Grindle kids back there that are learning about Jesus because of a mama that heard about Jesus here. And you may not realize, realize it, Sister Meyer, but Sister Meyer's fingerprints are all over Calvary Tabernacle and Alto. So today I preach from a very interesting standpoint. Today I've come to preach and, 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 and let you know that I love you more than you realize. But I, I've heard from God and I'm convinced that if here today and on the live stream, the Lord is about to minister to this church. If you're a guest here, I, I don't apologize for what I'm about to preach, but it may not make much sense right now. Just clap a few times and say amen. At least make, you, make me feel like I'm on point. But for the church today, I have a word from God. And if you will allow me to just bear my heart and be transparent, I'll leave and pastor can fix all the mistakes that I made. But I really feel that the Lord has ordained this moment. Amen. I've come to preach from this title. I will not give a text right now because I'm going to be in the Word a lot today. But I've come to preach from this thought. I've just come to preach about keepers of the glory. Keepers of the glory. We've just saying, God, show me your glory. If you believe that, would you just lift your hands right now before we get into the Word of the Lord and say, God, open my heart. Open my spirit. Prepare me. God, I want to I want to hear from you today. Lord, we need you right now. I'm asking God that you would anoint me to preach what I feel very strongly that you have given me for this moment, for this congregation. I'm asking God that you would open their hearts and their minds to receive the word of the Lord. I pray for not just those here today, but those that are watching online, that will watch online, that maybe, God, they don't feel good right now physically. I'm asking, Lord, that you would begin to speak into their spirit and that your, your hand would begin to move wherever they are right now. I pray for this congregation that your hand and your anointing would flow, that the glory would fall in abundant life sanctuary of groves. God, we need your glory. Show us your glory. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. It's 11 o'clock. I promise to be mindful of the time. I promise also to preach what the Lord's given me. So if we go a little long, just bear with me. Again, pastor will make it all right next week. Praise God. I do have permission, by the way. I asked him. Amen. <laughs> I want to begin this morning by declaring something to you. I know it's been a crazy year. I know it's been a weird year. But I want you to know God is up to something. I want you to understand, without any doubt, without any fear, that the Lord is still on the throne and He's still in business. COVID didn't shut God down. By the way, if you're on the live stream, it's okay to say amen too, okay? I know you're in your living room. It's okay. Nobody's paying attention. God's going to move in here in a second. The reality is the Lord is moving in our world. I don't care who you voted for, the color of your skin. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. I don't care where you come from, your past, present, or your future. I'm here to remind you that the Lord we serve is a mighty, big, wonderful Savior. To be specific on that Savior part, let me remind you that the day of revival is not over. Believe it or not, God can fill somebody with the Holy Ghost on a live stream. God can begin to move over situations and the person be not even present in the building. I want you to hear me today. The Lord is on the move and He does have a plan in spite of what goes on in our world. God is moving today. 
I know we've quoted it for years. Joel 2.28, it shall come to pass afterwards, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. We've, we've quoted it so much, we're kind of sick of it. So let me give you a new verse in case you need another one. Matthew 24, Jesus is asked by his disciples, when shall the end of time be? When will you return? And he begins to list out a ton of stipulations. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famine and pestilence. Uh, There's going to be people turning away from truth. The love of many shall wax cold. And then he sums it all up uh, in Matthew 24, 13 and says, uh, and he, uh, but he that shall endure unto the end, uh, the same shall be saved. The sad thing is, is that's where we stop. Get ready for this. This single verse may be the worst curse in Pentecost. I got your attention now. Because all of us have a maintenance mentality. I hate to tell you, Flash, but Jesus didn't start a maintenance ministry. Nowhere in your Bible will you find where Jesus just said, hold on till I come. Just, just, just barely make it. Just No, no, no. Go to the next verse. Because verse 14 of Matthew 24 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all, all the world. In Africa and Alto. In groves. Amen. In Europe and Asia. To the blacks, to the whites, to the Hispanics. It doesn't matter if they're oriental. I don't care uh, how much money they make. uh, Whether it's across the tracks or not. uh, The gospel's going to be preached uh, to all the world. uh, in the Somebody yell revival. Revival steal the word uh, for 2020 uh, and beyond. Uh, God wants to pour out his spirit. Some of you hadn't heard me yet, so let me bring it to where you live. Uh, God uh, wants to pour out revival uh, on Abundant Life Sanctuary uh, in Groves, Texas. God wants to bring back backsliders. Uh, God wants to bring back wayward sons and daughters. Uh, God wants to bring in the drug addicts and the prostitutes. Uh, God wants to move over the homosexuals. Uh, God God wants to change uh, lives today. Uh, Not yesterday, uh, not 10 years from now. Uh, God wants to do it today. Uh, His arm is not slack uh, concerning his promises. Uh, As some men count slackness. But Peter said, uh, he is long-suffering to usward, uh, not willing that any should perish, uh, but that all uh, should come uh, to repentance. God wants to pour out his spirit Come on, sweetheart, keep praying. Come on, Grandma, don't stop fasting. Come on, Papa, don't you start praying for that baby because God wants to bring them back. God wants to pour out His Spirit. I know you prayed for your neighbor. Y'all don't believe me. Okay, I'll tell you a story. This is really happening in 2020. Oh, glory, I hope I don't mess up, but we're just going to keep on going. Watch this. Y'all don't know my great uncle. I have a great uncle, my dad's uncle. And when I say that he's rough, he rough. Okay? You just got to know my great uncle, okay? Man doesn't go to church. Doesn't want anything to do with God. Cuss you before he say anything nice about you. Mother's Day 2020. We came back after about eight weeks of quarantine, eight weeks of just doing online church. Guess who showed up? Uncle Rusty, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I know I, y'all think I always got faith, but that's with my response. What are you doing here? Well, that's good to have Uncle Rusty here at church Sunday. Praise God, we saw a miracle. Wednesday, I go to unlock the doors. Guess who's there? Uncle Rusty. Uncle Rusty, are you sick? Are you dying? What's wrong? The next Sunday. And the next Sunday. And then on a Tuesday night prayer meeting. Nobody comes to Tuesday night prayer meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just what happens at home. Let me tell you something. That man and his wife have been to our church every service except for probably three since Mother's Day. 
And Sister Meyer, I've watched that hardened man, the last person I ever thought God would ever get a hold of, sit in church services where the Holy Ghost would begin to move and big old tears would run down his face. Uh, and he's, he hadn't done it anything yet, but he's told me, he said, Jordan, I, I'm going to get you to baptize me someday. Uh, I, Wait, somebody said we couldn't have revival in the middle of a pandemic. Well, sweetheart, let me just go ahead and pop your bubble. God's moving. He's doing it in spite of COVID-19. He's doing it in spite of church closure. He's doing it when everybody else said it's impossible. God's still moving. Now, I got to preach, so give me a second here. Because let's be truly honest this morning. I'm not the first preacher to talk about revival. And I I fear that some of you may think, well, clap a few times, maybe who hush, we've heard that before. I understand that this year has been absolutely incredible. And I don't say it's been good incredible. It's been crazy. But also for groves, it's been tragic. I know who I'm preaching to today. I feel your loss. Please, I hope. I hope I'm not coming across across as wrong today. But I know a little bit about the struggle that this church has gone through. From pandemic and sickness to the loss of an incredible man in Bishop Meyer. To families leaving. To transition. And it's really hard to see the silver lining in the cloud when, let's be honest, we're missing a lot of folks here today. If we're honest today, we'll we'll understand that we feel very much like the children of Israel. We know what it's like to have the glory promised, but we've never seen the fulfillment of the promise. The reality is we've heard about the promised land just like they've heard for years, 400 to be more exact, but we've not seen it yet. The good news is we've left Egypt. The good news is we've seen God move. The good news is we've seen the hand of the Lord in our lives. But the reality is we're 40 years in and there's no promise. Oh, I know where you are today. I I felt your frustration in the Holy Ghost. We're in transition between promise given and promise fulfilled just like Israel. But you hear me today, just like Israel, God had a plan. You hear me today. God gave Moses on Mount Sinai two specific things. He gave them the law. We call them the Ten Commandments. But he also gave them the pattern of the, test of the tabernacle. The result was that God not only told them how to live, God also told them how to worship. I'll say it like this. God gave them the rules, but he also gave them the ability to seek forgiveness. God laid out the approach and said, here's how I want you to live, but I also know that you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to stumble and fall. And somebody say, that's me, because I'll say it, that's me. But God also said, I'm going to make a way for you to step into my presence. I'm going to make a way for you to feel the atonement. The glory to fall in spite of your problems, in spite of your mistakes, in spite of your sin. God made a way. But hear me, God never told Israel to just camp out in the wilderness. After he gave them law and after he gave them tabernacle, he told them that they were to transition toward their promise. In fact, if you study the last few verses of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35, the Bible says that after they got the law and they also got the tabernacle, that the cloud of the glory covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode there. It lived, the glory filled the tabernacle. Yet God also knew that there would come a moment, there would come times where they would need to transition. Everybody with me so far? And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says that when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they journeyed not until the day that it was taken up. In other words, the glory sat down on the house of God. But there would come a time, there would come a moment when the presence, the glory, the Shekinah of God would literally pick up off the tabernacle and leave. About a month ago, God stirred me in my spirit and said, that's where they're at. There's many of us looking going, we feel transition. 
and we're having problems finding the glory. Where do we go? I'm here to tell you the glory has not departed from Abundant Life Sanctuary. Don't you dare write Ichabod on the door and say, it's all over. Let's just turn it all in and and lock the doors and go, go do our thing. But no, my friend, God has a purpose. And God knows, you mark my words, God knows if you stay where you are, you'll never cross Jordan. You'll never step into the promised land. So you've got to transition toward your promise. Am I making sense? So the glory picks up. I, can't, I have no Bible for this, Sister Meyer. Please don't get on to me for this because I don't have Bible for this. But I can't, my mind works weird. Don't tell anybody, but my mind works weird. I can't help but wonder, what was it like the first day the glory left? For a society so dependent on the glory of God, they got their food, they got their water, and they got their direction from the glory. One day they wake up and the glory's gone. I don't know if it happened immediately. I don't have it overnight. I don't know if it was a gradual process. But one day they woke up and said, where did the glory go? Where is it at? What are we going to do? The glory's left. Are you with me so far? The Holy Ghost is trying to tell us God's transitioning us to the promise. But hear me. When God gave the law and when God gave the tabernacle, There's a little bit of something in all of that. I know it's boring to read. It's killed many a bread program. But I promise you, in the middle of numbers, it's there. God gave the recipe for transition. He said, when my glory gets up and leaves, here's how you're going to follow it. Y'all with me? So if you go to Numbers chapter 4, and I promise we don't have time to go through all of this. But if you go to Numbers chapter 4, you will find that when the glory would depart, God gave Moses the exact protocol for how to transition everything. He told him how to, how to march. He told him how to camp. He told him who was to go first, who was to go second, what group was to go third. He told him everything they needed to know. And he tells Moses, and by the way, when the glory picks up, uh, here's what I want you to do. The Bible says that Aaron, the high priest, and his sons were ordained ordained by God to prepare the tabernacle to move. The Bible says that they went in and they began to lay the tapestries and they began to lay the veil and and blue cloth and all of these things over the furniture and they began to prepare the ark and the the altar and, and, and the candlestick and all of the things for transition. They began to prepare it to move. There were three different families in the tribe of Levi. There were three different branches, if you will. There were the Morarites, the son of Morari. Their job was easy. They were to carry the structure, the the boards and the pillars and all of the structural components of the tabernacle. The sons of Gershon, or the Gershonites, they were called of God to take and carry all of the tent and the coverings and all of those things that were necessary to actually fold over the structure. And then there were the Kohathites, or the sons of Kohath. Their job was to carry the furniture. You're with me. The high priest prepared, but the Levites carried. Are you with me? The difference between the Kohathites and the other two families, number seven and nine tells us that the other two families got wagons to bear their articles. But the Kohathites were ordered by God to reach down against the golden staves, put those staves on their shoulders, and carry the furniture. You hear me today, the ark of the covenant which represented the glory of God did not transition on a wagon, it transitioned on the shoulders of a Levite of the family of Kohath. The altar of God did not transition on, an, on, an, on a wagon, it transitioned because a Kohathite said I've got a burden. I've come to preach to this church today and tell you it is time. For somebody in this congregation and somebody online to rise up and say, I will carry the burden. 
Somebody's got to make up your mind this morning uh, saying, hey, I'm going into 2021 uh, with my mind made up uh, that if we're going to see the glory of God in our church, uh, if we're going to see the supernatural, if we're going to see souls saved, uh, we're going to be willing uh, to reach down uh, and shoulder a burden uh, and nobody else may want to carry it. Uh, Nobody else may feel the burden. Uh, Nobody else may recognize the need. Uh, But this old boy uh, is going to carry the burden, carry Carry the glory, carry the fire, carry the worship, carry the praying. Whatever I got to do, I'm a keeper of the glory. Hear me today. This is Bible. Hear me today. Aaron never carried the ark. He was the high priest, ladies and gentlemen. He had access into the presence of Almighty God. He was the only person who could step before the Ark of the Covenant uh, and see it in all of its splendor. He was the only one that had access. But when it came time for transition, God said, Don't touch it! I need somebody else to carry the burden for a while. God sent me here to tell you your pastor is here. He's going to carry some things that you will never understand. But hear me today. He is preparing you to transition. He needs somebody to carry a few things. (laughs) Come on, he needs some help today, church. He didn't tell me to preach this. The Holy Ghost told me to preach this. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. I'm just here to tell you right now, God's calling us uh, to pick up a burden and say, Pastor Jason, I'm going to carry it. You're not going to be the only one praying. You're not going to be the only one fasting. You're not the only one seeking the face of God. Uh, You're not going to be the only one in the altar. I'm going to carry the glory because I have got a promise. I've got children that need to be saved. Uh, I've got grandbabies that need to be saved. So if the glory is going to go further, it's going to be on the backs of mama and daddy. It's going to be on the backs of some grandparents. It's going to be some, on the back of some faithful saints that will say, hey, I may not have much money, but I can pray. I may not always can sing in the choir, but I can fast. I may not always know the right theological answer, but I can teach a Bible study. I'm going to carry the glory. Jesus, help us today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so far out of my notes, we're in trouble. But the good news is we're getting rid of them. Hallelujah. Hear me today. David understood the importance and the value of glory keepers. 2 Samuel chapter 6, the Bible says that David's king. He's having a great time being king and he decides, I want the presence of God or the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. Now the Ark of the Covenant had been away from Israel for 20 years. Saul never bothered with the glory. And for 20 years, the children of Israel went on with their daily lives without the very symbol of what God is to them. The most iconic piece of furniture in Jewish history. And it's somewhere off off by the side. Uh, Nobody's worried about it. Nobody's paying attention to it. Nobody cares. David said, let's bring the glory back. David's zealous about the glory. He's so zealous, in fact, that he gets everybody together, said, we're going to bring the glory back. He puts it on a brand new cart, puts some uh, registered uh, oxen to him. I mean, he's ready. We're going to have a mighty move of God. They get to going and shouting and jigging and doing their Pentecostal thing. And all of a sudden, the oxen stumble. The cart shifts. The Ark of the Covenant seems to about to slide off. And a man by the name of Uzzah, a very honorable man, the Bible says, puts his hand to the ark to steady the ark. All he's trying to do is protect the glory. And God strikes him dead immediately. Because God said you can't touch it. You can't carry that. There's a proper way to transition. And David gets so frustrated that it stops the momentum of revival three months. David goes back to being king. The ark goes into Obadiah's house. And they go to try to figure out this problem. Notice with me what the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obedidim, all that pertaineth unto him, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedidim into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bear the ark, they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. Now, if you've been around Pentecost, oh, I don't know, two weeks, 
You've heard us preachers talk about David dancing before the presence of God. I've heard it. I've preached it so much I'm sick of it. Oh, that's too honest. I'm sorry. The reality is I never thought about this before. I thought the Lord nudged me the other day and say, Hey, David danced because somebody stood. You didn't hear me. David and all the people worshiped before the presence of God, but there were some, there were some folks. They're not named. We don't know who they are. But when that sixth step was taken, brother, they stood and carried the glory. I thank God for the shouters. I thank God for those that can huck a buck and hang from the chandeliers and run the aisles and roll on the floor. But you give me four or five people that know how to stand and bear the glory. And I promise you I'll tear, tear hell's kingdom down. Because I need, you know, as a pastor, I need somebody that knows how to stand and bear the weight of the glory. True revival will never come until you and I learn uh, how to shoulder the immense weight and responsibility of the glory of God. Uh, we can shout and dance all day, but the ark's going to eventually stumble and somebody's going to get killed. But I'm here to tell you, if somebody will just get under the burden uh, and square their shoulders back uh, and plant their feet uh, and say, Pastor, you do what you need to do. Uh, let the church do what they need to do. I will bear the glory. I'm a keeper of the glory. Uh, I'm going to carry the glory. I did a study the other day on Obadiah. The Bible says Obadiah was a Levite. He was kind of just one of the guys that he was of the tribe, but he didn't do a whole lot. Uh, but one day the ark of the Lord showed up at his house, and for three months uh, the Lord blessed him. I don't know what happened during that three months, uh, but something clicked in Obadiah. Uh, and the next time we see him mentioned, uh, the Bible says he's a porter in the house of God. What that means uh, is Obadiah picked up his house uh, and said, Baby, I know it's crazy, but we're going to follow the glory. He took his entire family away from daddy's farm and said, just give me the glory. I'll serve with the glory. I'll keep the ark. And that's exactly what God's looking for today. Somebody that'll say, I'll keep my family around the glory. I'm gonna raise my family serving in the glory. I'm gonna, bear, I'm gonna keep my marriage around the glory. I'm gonna bear the glory of God. Ha, ha, ha. Come on, let's worship him right now. Holy Ghost won't let me go further. Let's worship. Jesus. 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 Oh, God, have your way right now. Jesus. Jesus. I felt like the Lord laid some names on my heart. I'm telling you, I'm so far in right now, it scares me. But I'm here to tell you, I feel like the Lord laid names on my heart. I can, I can call you out, I'm not. But I feel like the Lord put specific names of couples and families that said, if they'll get what you're preaching, I will transition this church. Mm. Come on, quit doubting how much. I know you don't have a lot of money. And I know you may not be the first pick to sing on a solo, but you hear me right now, God's called you. And I don't care what they say. God's called you. And I, I know it may seem like there's a lot of things that hold you back. Maybe a past that says, I, I don't know if I can follow that. I don't know if I can do that because I, I've got a messed up past. Let me tell you right now, God is able. <laughs> Quit worried. Some of you believe more in your past and your failures than you do believe in God. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. I'll say it again. Some of you believe more in your past than you do in your God. <laughs> let, me, let me show you a Bible for it. Number 16. The Kohathites were supposed to bear the ark, right? Supposed to bear the tabernacle and all the furniture. A man by the name of Korah rises up in number 16 and rebels against Moses. He literally looks at Moses and says, Who in the world do you think you are? We're just as holy. Read it. Number 16. We're just as holy as you are. Just as called as you are. We've been anointed just like you have. I'm bearing the ark. And God says, let me at him. You with me? Let me at him. Let me get a part of him. 
And, and he said, he tells Moses and Aaron separate. And the Bible says that Korah and all of his followers, the Bible says that the God allows the earth to open and swallow Korah. Destroyed Korah and his followers. Let me tell you a little side note here. That did not disqualify the Kohathites from bearing the glory. They didn't go to the work the next day and say, well, we're going to have to quit. Because there's one among us that messed up. God said, no, get under the burden. You're not hearing me. Okay, let me say it again. Go back to the book of Psalms. And you read multiple times. I've never done a count. I don't have a full total. But at multiple times, there is a little prescript, if you will, a little, a little, little note at the beginning of the Psalms. And it says that this psalm is to be sung by the who? The sons of Korah. You're not hearing me. God said, not only can they bear the ark, but they can sing about it. But you don't know who I am and what I've done. I know exactly who you are and what you've done. It don't matter. God says, it don't matter who you are and what you've done. If I can use the sons of Korah to bear my glory, to worship before my glory, to lead the congregation in praise in front of the glory, I can use anybody. The danger is we can sometimes get a Korah mentality. Well, I give so much to this church and I'm so talented and if they, if, they, if they try to tell me what to do, I'll just sit down and the praise team will fall apart. Sweetheart, let me tell you a little secret. God doesn't need your praise and your voice or your money. God just needs your availability. I got to calm down. That was too hard. I, I'm supposed to be an evangelist today. But the reality is, he owns the cattle on the thousand hills. He just needs somebody that's willing to bear the glory. Oh, you don't believe me? Watch what the Bible says. Judas went and hung himself after he messed up and failed God. You know what God did? He didn't throw in the towel and say, well, bless God, there's no way I can do this. My plan's been foiled. I wanted 12 and I've only got 11. You know what he did? He found an old murderer named Saul and said, if Judas doesn't want it, would you like to bear the glory? And Saul, who later became Paul, said, yes, Lord, here I am. Hey, church, God's looking for us to pick up the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand. I'm done. Some of you are getting scared because I keep throwing pages in the bucket here. I promise I'm done. <laughs> We've heard it so many times the last few weeks. It's Christmas. Everybody knows the nativity story. We pass somebody's house now. My daughter points out the window. Look, Mommy and Daddy. It's away in a manger. Oh, the words she just said. You're right, baby. That is our way in the manger. God would leave his glory in heaven. He would robe himself in flesh and he would be born in a little town called Bethlehem. No pomp, no circumstance, nobody there to welcome him. Just a bunch of sheep and a few shepherds. John would pick up the pen 60 years later and write that it happened like this. That the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. We saw his glory. We saw what Moses had asked for in Exodus 33 and God said no. We saw things that the prophet Isaiah was not given information. We understood things that both Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all missed. We saw his glory. But don't you realize that there was a glory keeper who for nine months carried that baby boy in her womb? A little girl from a little town called Nazareth that had history been written by man, she would have never occupied center stage. At the time, many even doubted her integrity. She was just a poor girl from a little town in the middle of nowhere. 
But God said, she's a keeper of the glory. And when she held that little baby in a stable, Sister Meyer, and the old song says when she kissed the face, when she kissed your little baby, did you realize you kissed the face of God? What are you saying, Mark Lowry? I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying, hey, that's the glory. And for 30 years, Mama Mary protected the glory. When he was 12 years old, it was Mama Mary that said, we got to go back after the glory. When he was 30 years old, it was Mama Mary that said, why don't you fix this problem at the wedding call of Cana and make a little more wine. We, we need something else to drink and the glory, what am I telling you, church? I'm telling you that it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or your past or your future. It doesn't matter how old you are or young you are. I don't care any of that. God doesn't care any of that. God's just looking for somebody to say, I'll bear the glory. And the devil would like to destroy you today. I'd like to destroy this church and tell you it's not worth it. Fight over it. Talk about it. But don't ever bear it. You want to know why he's like that? Because if you go in Ezekiel chapter 28... Ezekiel 28, you'll find that verse 14 records this about Satan. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. Lucifer, in all of God's splendor, was given the sole job of defending God's glory. It was his job, ladies and gentlemen, to guard the glory, to keep the glory. And he got to looking at himself and said, look how great I am. And God said, you can't do that and keep the glory. And it is God's desire to give you that same ability to reflect his glory and the enemy wants to destroy it because of what he lost. God's calling us together right now to say, hey God, I don't know what 2021 holds, but I'm going to hold you. You know how you get a burden? Pick it up. We think it's a magical formula. God, just hit a burden on me. Throw one on me. It doesn't work like that, sweetheart. Just pick it up. God's looking for somebody, a young person, an elder, a couple, a family to say, God, I will carry your glory. I don't know if you feel comfortable with it, but if you do, I want you to step out of your pew. If you hear the call of this preacher and you hear the Spirit moving right now, I invite you to an altar. Say, God, here I am. I'll carry it. I may not understand all that pastor does. I may not get everything down. I may not have all of it figured out yet, but God, I'll get under the burden. I'll carry the burden. I'll step into the burden. God, I'll be a keeper of the glory. I'll pray until you move. I'll fast, God. I'll, win a, I'll teach a Bible study. I'll win a soul. God, I'll give. I'll do whatever I've got to do because I want to see the glory fall in abundant life sanctuary. I want to see you move and I want to be a part of it.
Come on, church, let's just flow in this right now. The presence of the Lord is moving. Come on, God's working, God's restoring, God's transitioning. If you're on the live stream and you're still watching, go ahead and lift your hands right now. The Holy Ghost wants to minister into your pain, into your sickness, into your circumstance. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we need your glory. God, we believe chains fall. We believe fear is cast out. Show us your glory. Let your glory fall in this house today. In the name of Jesus.